Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So, as I'm sure most of you know, International Women's Day is coming up this Friday, the 8th of March. Now, International Women's Day has been a source of frustration for me over the past few years, namely because it's been swarmed by victim fourth wave feminists who, while perfectly happy to give a kind of tokenistic nod to the struggles of women in countries with actual gendered problems, like, say, Saudi Arabia, would prefer to focus on the largely imaginary problems of Western women. The usual players will all be in action, claiming to empower women while simultaneously telling them how terrible their lives are and what appalling struggles they will face as educated middle class liberated women in a Western capitalist democracy. And it's not just on March the 8th that they do this. They go on with this doomsday preaching all year round. So to commemorate International Women's Day 2019, I have put together the top five female empowerment fails of the past 12 months. So enjoy, or don't, because let's face it, they're not very enjoyable. The screens of Australian televisions were graced with the wonderful presence of none other than Jordan Peterson on February 25th when he appeared on the notoriously left-leaning Q&A program on the ABC. He got into a little bit of a tussle with Labour MP and evident feminist demagogue Terry Butler on the subject of quotas. Now, as a woman from a left-wing political party, of course Terry Butler is a proponent of quotas and believes that they are necessary to eliminate what she calls unfair structures. She also believes this. One of the great things about being a feminist is that you want everyone to be valued for the inherent dignity that they have as a human being. <laughs> Anyway, she made the near-fatal error of attempting to throw sarcasm at Dr. Peterson after he made an insightful and enlightened point about the dangers of placing group identity over individual identity. If you're a proponent, for example, of equality of outcome, of quotas, then you de facto accept the proposition that it's the group identity that is primary. Or maybe you just think that representative democracy should be representative. Mm. Maybe you just think that women should be equally represented in the decision-making fora of our nation. Maybe that's really just about having proper equality in a body that's meant to be representative. Well, I do believe that women should have... I, I don't understand your question, I well, guess. Well, I guess you <laughs> yeah. don't. That's pretty I obvious, don't. unfortunately. Well, how about if you phrase it more clearly instead of just insulting me? Oh, Terry, big mistake. Look, 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 look at it this way. Let's talk about quotas for a minute. So there's a, a very wide array of jobs that are fundamentally uh, done by men. 99.9% .9 of bricklayers are men. Should we have quotas for women? Is bricklaying representative democracy? That has nothing to do with the question. The question is if, 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 if there's evidence of structural inequality and oppression because women aren't precisely represented at 50% in all professions at all levels, then why don't we have a conversation about having women represented it in all professions at all levels? Well, we why do we talk about the C-suite, for example? Why do we talk about politics and positions of power? Why don't we talk about it across the board? Okay. And just like that, Terry was presented with the question that she and it seems like all feminists in the world tend to avoid. Why, when you talk about equal representation of women across the workforce via quotas, do you only talk about quotas in the top ranks of the most glamorous professions? And as you can see, Terry had absolutely no answer. Well, except for this. You pose a question to Terry Butler, uh, <laughs> go ahead and answer it, then we'll hear from the other panelists. His question to me. Well, yeah, if you'd, about like, bricklayers. If, if you'd like to answer the question about bricklayers. And that attitude right there about bricklayers is why people like Hillary Clinton lose elections. Next. The misrepresentation of the gender wage gap is the biggest and most harmful lie that feminists tell. Rather than it proving that women do not get paid equally to men for the same work, it is simply a baby arithmetic lump sum average of the earnings paid to men and women over the course of a year. It does not take into account hours worked, different industries, time taken off, level of skill, or level of occupation. It is based on life choices, not inequality. Now, this information is available to anyone with a shred of curiosity and the ability to do a Google search. Yet politicians still think we're dumb enough to buy the lie, 
so they keep lying, like another Australian Labor MP, Tanya Plibersek. There is no way anyone can tell me, Mr Deputy Speaker, that it's a coincidence that in an industry where 98 per cent of the employees are women that you see this sort of undervaluation of the importance of this work. It makes no sense to me that someone with a certificate three in early childhood education earns 20 something bucks an hour and someone with a certificate three in metal work earns 40 something bucks an hour. There is no way that that is anything other than gender based discrimination. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Australia's Deputy Leader of the Opposition. So, according to Tanya Plibersek, the reason that metal workers get paid double that of early childcare workers is not because they work outdoors in dangerous conditions, you know, dealing with hot metal so they can build bridges and oil rigs, which in turn requires them to buy expensive equipment and expensive vehicles to transport it in, which while that is a tax deduction is still a large upfront expense, nor is it because they have a much greater chance of getting injured or, you know, dying on the job is because childcare work is traditionally female work and therefore undervalued because sexism. Now, I have enormous respect for anyone who works with children and I am fully aware of the difficulties and necessities and the value of that work. But to compare childcare work with metal work is to compare chalk and cheese. Not all three-year degrees are created equal because not all professions are created equal. And for Tanya Plibersek to spread these lies is just another example of a feminist claiming to empower women while simultaneously telling them that their lives are going to be inherently terrible because they're women. It also makes her and her party look colossally stupid. Next. Third on the list is former actress and current Duchess of Sussex, Meghan Markle. Now, prior to marrying Prince Harry, Meghan was known for her pro-feminist and anti-Trump views. However, since becoming a Duchess, she's had to tone down her politics because, understandably, the royal family is expected to remain apolitical. And yet, somehow, she's managed to sneak just a teeny bit of fourth-wave feminist commentary into her royal duties. It was revealed by the Sunday Times on February 17th that she supported a campaign by black academics and students to decolonize the curriculum and confront the so-called legacy of empire and racism on university campuses. The movement seeks to add black and female writers to the university curriculums rather than focusing heavily on male, pale and stale ones. Mira Sabaratnam, one of the advocates for the movement, said it was wonderful to see the Duchess standing up for female equality, adding, many of the issues around racial equality are similar and it is great to see her embrace this. Change is long overdue. Okay. By pale, male and stale authors, Meghan Markle and those leading the movement are presumably referring to the likes of Shakespeare, Lord Byron, Ernest Hemingway, Oscar Wilde, Bram Stoker, Schauser, Edgar Allan Poe, etc. You know, only all of those who are universally regarded as the very best writers, poets and thinkers in all of human history. And that has nothing to do with the fact that they're white men and everything to do with the fact that they are brilliant. And yet, for some reason, Meghan Markle would be happy to bump them off and replace them with some ambiguous non-white female author, because apparently nowadays that's racial equality. Oh, okay. Next. Number two on the list is, of course, Hillary Clinton and her comments about white women being the root of all evil. Well, that is, not voting for her in 2016. Now, this clip needs very little introduction, so here it is. Part of that is a, an identification with the Republican Party uh, and a, uh, a, a sort of ongoing pressure uh, to uh, vote the way that your husband, your boss, uh, your son, whoever, uh, believes you should. So here we have a woman who claims to want to empower and support all women, while at the same time insisting that women who don't support her are capitulating to their husbands or other male figures in their lives. It's classic feminist derangement syndrome. To feminists, a woman who is conservative actually isn't entitled to that opinion. There's either something morally wrong with her, or she is too weak-minded to defy her husband's wishes. Such hypocrisy. Next. And finally, we have reached number one. 
and I think that's worth a drum roll. Number one on the list of top five female empowerment fails is that bartender turned politician, the self-proclaimed socialist darling, that congresswoman that we all love to hate, the one, the only, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who will henceforth be known for the remainder of this video as simply Red. Last year, Little Red got into a rather revealing online confrontation with everyone's favorite debate machine, conservative commentator Ben Shapiro. It started after the Blaze Media's Ali Beth Stuckey posted a satirical video of a made-up interview between her and Red. Now, Ali Beth copped some heat for this, including from Red herself. Republicans are so scared of me that they're faking videos and presenting them as real on Facebook because they can't deal with reality anymore. Needless to say, Ben Shapiro took this assertion from Red that Republicans were afraid of her as a challenge and invited her to appear on The Daily Wire for a discussion or a debate. Hi, I really wanted to make just a direct appeal to Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. I would love to have a real conversation with you about the issues. I'm willing to offer $10,000 to your campaign today for you to come on our Sunday special and we can have an hour-long conversation about all the topics under the sun. Let's do this thing. Sadly, Red ignored this invitation. However, when this was pointed out to her, she had this to say. Just like catcalling, I don't owe a response to unsolicited requests from men with bad intentions. And also like catcalling, for some reason they feel entitled to one. Okay, as the left likes to say, let's unpack this. Red Cortez, so seemingly confident in her ideas that she's happy to accuse Republicans of being scared of her, ignores an amicable and honest request for a discussion or a debate, and when called on that, wilts like a little feminist flower by likening the invitation to catcalling. <laughs> In response to Red's reaction, Candace Owens, Kaya Jones, Katie Pavlich, and Ali Beth Stuckey herself, four female conservative powerhouses, all challenged Red to a debate since apparently Ben Shapiro was too sexist for her. And guess what? Red gave them no response either. Turns out it wasn't sexism she was resisting. It was having her ideas challenged that she wasn't interested in. So, Red Cortez, this pinnacle of progressivism and female empowerment, who presents herself as a warrior for the vulnerable, can't even summon the guts to test her ideas in a face-to-face -face setting. Beautiful, isn't it? So there you have it, the top five female empowerment fails of the past 12 months. Enjoy International Women's Day as best you can. I'm sure it and the year ahead will bring us many more examples like that for us to cringe over. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment, and if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my Subscribestar link and other ways you can support me.